Um, this, this message, again, I'm, I'm really excited about it. We're, we're in our simple series, uh, and my title for today is Simple, Jesus Calms the Storm. Now, we're going to be looking in Matthew chapter 8, verses 23 and 27, and I decided to put kind of a, a, a little bit of a clarity up there on what I mean by simple. You can go back real quick. <clears throat> simple just means clear not complicated, easy to understand, simplified, transferable principles. Was that enough like adjectives that I threw in there? Um, This series is not simple like you are not going to get anything from it. What we're doing is we're looking at scripture and finding very simple truths that we can live out because, listen, I am not a complicated guy. I would like to think of myself as a simple kind of guy that just, just, Give me what I need to know. Give me the facts. Like, I, I don't comprehend a whole lot of things. I'm not super deep at times. And so I need simple, transferable principles from Scripture that I can look at when I'm talking to somebody about uh, the Bible or about faith or whatever. I need some handles and, uh, of things to use in day-to-day life for myself and in conversations. And so I think that's where God's taken us here for a while to give you guys some simple things to um, to check out here. So um, we're going to be in Matthew chapter 8. So if you've got your Bibles, if you would turn to Matthew chapter 8, if you're not there already, uh, and we're going to move forward. So Matthew ch- uh, chapter 8, verse 23, um, it says, then he got into the boat and his disciples followed him. Now, pause for a second. We got one verse in and we're going to pause and talk for a couple minutes here. So it says, he got into the boat and his disciples followed him. This is talking about Jesus. This is kind of early on in his ministry. And he had some guys that were kind of like, okay, we want to check out this guy. He's pretty cool. He's doing some cool things. I don't know. There might be something to this guy. So he had this following. And so Jesus gets into this boat in the Sea of Galilee. Now, we all know the, the Sea of Galilee. It's not really a sea. It's a lake. Okay, it's the largest freshwater lake in Israel. It's about seven miles across and about 13 miles long. And the actual name for it, when, when you go there, they don't call it the Sea of Galilee. They call it Kinneret. And Kinneret means violin. Because if you look at the lake and you squint your eyes like this a little bit, it kind of looks like an upside down violin, although I don't really think it does much. But um, anyway, this, this first picture here shows us. So that's myself, and some of you guys remember Martin, and then that's Lacey right there, and then down in the rocks, there's Jessica, and Michael's kind of standing behind us there. That is the Sea of Galilee, and you can see the mountains over on the other side. So that's seven miles across. It's not, not very far there, but you can see it's, it's, it's kind of placid. It's kind of nice. It's, it's beautiful. You can go right down to the water, and there's kind of beachy areas at different places and whatnot. So um, it's pretty cool. Now, in 1986, there was, I guess, a drought, and um, the water level had receded a lot, like kind of record levels. And there were some people that lived in that area, and they were walking along the shore, and they felt something hard, and they kind of dug up a little bit, and it was some wood. And so they had a, a crew come in and kind of excavate, and they found a boat, and they dated the boat to be about 2,000 years old. So go ahead and show that next picture. So that's the boat that they found. Now, in no way, shape, or form am I claiming this is the boat that Jesus was in, right? Because that would be dumb, okay? But this is a boat that they found. This would have been very typical of one of the boats around that time, about 2,000 years or so ago. And they actually call this the Jesus boat, it's in a museum there in Israel. Uh, now, on the left-hand side, and, and you can see the people. I, this, I picked this picture because it kind of shows you scale. It's about 26 feet long. And then this is a recreation over here of what that boat would have looked like. So when we, around the time of Jesus, when it says, you know, they got into a boat and they were on, you know, the Sea of Galilee or on Kinneret, this is a typical fishing boat, about 26 foot long. It would hold, you know, a handful of guys, and that's it. Pretty cool, huh? Pretty cool that they still find things like that. Um, I, I love looking at archaeology because uh, all the time, and this is just a side note freebie, all the time they're like, oh, well, you can't prove that in the Bible because there's no archaeological evidence. And then guess what happens like 15, 20 years later? They find archaeological evidence that backs up that thing in the Bible, and that's happened over and over and over. I love that. So, all right. Matthew chapter 8, verse 24. 
It says, suddenly a furious storm came up on the lake so that the waves swept over the boat. Okay, by raise of hands, has anybody ever been in a horrible storm out on the boat? Yeah, we got a bunch of, of, of uh, boat ocean people here. Um, I was in a storm one time. Um, I've been in a lot of storms. Um, I've had some, some Lieutenant Dan moments, if you guys know what I'm talking about from Forrest Gump. But I was in the boat this one time, and um, we were out diving, and I didn't do this dive, this location. So I was running the boat, and my, my friend and his wife were down under, and they had a rope coming up to a buoy, and my job was to kind of follow them around. They were diving and spearfishing and lobstering and all of that. And when they were down, all of a sudden, this storm came up, and it was so bad. I mean, you, it, was, it was crazy. There was lightning everywhere. And I'm, I'm pulling on the, the rope, but there was so much kind of slack in the line that they didn't know. I'm revving the boat. They didn't hear it. And the storm was so bad, and it, and it kind of subsided after a while. And their daughter was with me. I had their daughter climb up to the front of the boat. It was that dangerous. I mean, lightning everywhere. It was so bad that I'm sitting there, and after it calmed for a minute, I'm like, what is that noise? Something is running. And finally, I figured out there was so much static electricity in the air that the fiberglass aerial, the antenna from the radio, was buzzing. You want to talk about getting ready to be zapped? It was bad. Okay, but it says, suddenly a furious storm came up on the lake so that the waves swept over the boat. The original word for this, maybe you're reading a translation, it says tempest, okay? But the original word, I want you to listen to the word and think of what it sounds like. It's seismos. What, what, what words do we get from seismos? Seismograph, seismic activity. The word that's actually used is more used in scripture for the word earthquake, that's how bad this storm was. Now, these were fishermen. They were, they were used to storms. They were used to waves. And, and on the Sea of Galilee, we've talked about this before. Because of the different temperatures in air and the Sea of Galilee, if you actually look at it, the Mediterranean Sea is here and the Sea of Galilee is here. There's mountains, and then it goes way down to about 700 feet below sea level is where the Sea of Galilee is. So you have this one temperature air here, and then you have mountains coming in and over the Mediterranean, and, and this, this different air comes in and mixes in the hot and the cold air, and all of a sudden, you have a crazy storm. And that's what happened. And these guys, they had seen a lot of storms, but this was very, very different. This leads us to our first point. Simple followers of Jesus are not exempt from life-threatening storms. Now, we're, we're starting off kind of easy because I probably don't have to tell you this, do I? I probably don't have to tell you that, guess what? You're going to go through some storms in life. And I don't mean like the weather and the rain and the lightning, although, you know, living in South Florida, we, we experience a lot of that. But I'm talking about the things in life that come up that hurt. They're painful. They wreck certain areas of our lives or certain relationships or certain financial issues or certain health issues, those types of storms. And I'm pretty sure I don't have to tell you that we're, we're all going to experience plenty of those storms in life. Simple followers of Jesus are not exempt from life-threatening storms. Now, here's a truth. We were created... The reason why we are here is to bring Jesus glory, honor, and praise. Okay, that we don't get to argue with that. That is just a fact. Our reason for existence is to bring Jesus glory, honor, and praise. Sometimes the best opportunities to do that are in the middle of a storm. I know you don't want to hear that. That's not great popular preaching, but sometimes the best way that we can do what we were created to do, to bring Jesus glory, honor, and praise, is to do it in the middle of a storm. I, I wrote this down. This was from an online source. I think it was a pastor. I stole it. I didn't write his name down, so I apologize, whoever you are, uh, but I'm going to steal it. It says, life is a series of problem-solving opportunities. 
The problems you face will either defeat you or develop you depending on how you handle them. We need to realize that God wants to use our problems for good in our lives. That is so true. And it's that perspective on how we can see those storms when they come up. That's so important. So back to verse 24. Suddenly, a furious storm came up on the lake so that the waves swept over the boat, but Jesus was sleeping. Jesus. Come on, Jesus. It's a bad storm. What are you doing, dude? Right? We want to say that. But I want to ask you this question. You ever feel like Jesus is sleeping in your storm? You ever been in the middle of that storm crying out to Jesus? You're like, Jesus, where are you? Like, okay, okay, I give it to you. Like, like, like show me what it is that you want me to learn from this, Jesus. And it just seems like he is sleeping. I promise you he's not. But that often happens. And we're like, Jesus, where are you? I need you in this time. Now, to make things worse, the way that this was originally written and the verbs that are used, I believe, are in the imperfect tense. So basically what it's saying is the waves kept coming over the boat. It wasn't like they were, they were cruising along. And you know when you're in the boat and like things are fine and that you're running and you take a wave the wrong way and it just kind of sprays everybody in the boat and it's like, oh, I hate that. You guys hate that too? I absolutely hate that. Or if you're like me, I like to watch some of those social media pages to where people just, their, their whole profession is to set up cameras at these inlets up in Miami, Fort Lauderdale, Boca, Hallover, all of that. And all day long, they just watch boats just stuff right into the waves. Anybody else just love the, yeah, see, there's, I know there's a bunch of you out there. Okay. This isn't just a one-time thing. This is written as the waves kept coming over the boat and kept coming over the boat and kept coming over the boat. But also it's written to say, and Jesus kept on sleeping. It's really the way it's written is showing this picture like this wasn't this, this little one-time, oh, little splash, and oh, Jesus didn't feel the spray. And No, no, no. This kept happening. This, this was tumultuous. They were in big trouble, and Jesus just kept on sleeping. So here's a question. How is it possible to sleep in the middle of a storm like this? How could you do that? Is that even possible? I'm, I'm talking literally, I'm talking about a storm, being in a boat, waves crashing over the boat. How is it possible to sleep in the middle of a storm like this? I have two reasons. Number one, you know the one who controls the storm. Hopefully you do. Or very simply, number two, you are the one who controls the storm. And we know Jesus controls storms. I know I'm, I just gave away the whole story, all right? But we know Jesus controls the storms. Verse 24, suddenly a furious storm came up on the lake so that the waves swept over the boat, but Jesus was sleeping. Now, I want to come back to this verse because I want to teach us two really, really cool things about Jesus that we can see from this verse. Now, you're going to go, well, I already knew those things. But, okay, the first one is, Jesus could sleep because he was fully God. Okay, I, I don't know if you really know that, but Jesus in his human state was fully God. There wasn't like, oh, he was partially God, he could do, no, no, no. He was absolutely fully God. That's why he could sleep. He did control the storm. But I think the second part is just way cooler. And this just speaks volumes to me as a, as a fallible human that Jesus needed sleep because he was human. See, he was fully God. He was 100% God, but also he was 100% human. And you're like, Trev, your math is kind of off. That's 200%. I know, Jesus was extra, okay? But fully God and fully man at the same time. And Jesus was, was ministering so much that he needed sleep. Like, like I, I'm, okay, I'm, he knew this was going to happen, and he was like, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go to sleep so we could use this as an example. 
Honestly, I just think Jesus was dead tired. I think Jesus was so busy doing ministry that he was absolutely exhausted. And so he just, he needed some sleep. In, in fact, several times we can look and, and Jesus and his disciples got in a boat and crossed over the Sea of Galilee. I bet Jesus loved those times because he was like, I can't do anything else. I'm tired of talking to these knuckleheads. They're not getting it half the time anyway. I'm going to take a nap. That was probably his nap time. Like me, I love, I'm one of those weirdos that love flying. Okay, I love to get in a plane. I love taking off. I love landing. I love the fact that I'm, I'm 30, 40,000 feet in the air in a big piece of metal. That fascinates me. But also, I love the fact that I have to just sit there and not really do anything. I love to just, I, I got to watch a movie. I can study. I can read my Bible. I can go to sleep. And I love those times where I'm just kind of confined and I don't get a whole lot of other options. I think that's kind of what Jesus was doing here. He was absolutely exhausted. Now listen, ministry is amazing. I love doing ministry. It's rewarding. It's a blessing to be able to do ministry, especially as a job. That's what I get to do in life. It's my calling. But it's also draining. It's tiring, stressful, okay? And Jesus had constantly, 24 hours a day, seven days a week for three years, he went around teaching, preaching, healing, ministering, praying, serving. That's exhausting. I love you guys, but you're exhausting. No, I'm just kidding. You guys are easy. Believe me, you guys are easy. I've heard of churches that's like, I love my church, Lord, okay? But ministry is absolutely exhausting. And I believe Jesus in his human state was just flat tired. And the reason, I, I, I'm making such a big deal about this, and I, I really want you to get this because this just blows me away, is because I look at Jesus and, and we we. We kind of, we categorize him as God, which that's not incorrect, that's fully correct, but we often forget about his human side. And so when we are going through life, we, we sometimes forget that, hey, Jesus experienced pretty much everything and more of what we have experienced in life, especially the difficult parts. And it, honestly, it just makes verses like Hebrews 4.15 jump out so much to me. I want to read this verse to you. It says, for we do not have a high priest, and, and the high priest is Jesus. The verse right before this calls Jesus the high priest. So it says, for we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses. That means whatever you've gone through, believe me, Jesus has gone through it as well and, and, and worse. All right? But we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are. So believe me, if you've been tempted, Jesus been, has been tempted even more. Just as we are, yet he did not sin. There's the fully God part. So I love the fact that my Jesus, my Savior, my God can relate to me, and I can relate to him in his human form at least. That, that, that he's just not this kind of high and pie in the sky kind of, oh, he doesn't really get what I'm going through. Oh, no, he very much gets what we are going through. Verse 25, the disciples went and woke him saying, Lord, save us. We're going to drown. Now, <laughs> can you imagine? I, I, I would love to know how long they waited like, you, you probably didn't want to wake up Jesus, right? If he's sleeping, you know he's tired, you know he's the savior of the world and all of that. He probably needs a nap. I wonder how long they were like, I don't, I don't, you, you John, go wake him up. I'm not waking him up. You wake him up. You know, they probably sent like Judas or, you know, Thomas or one of those guys. I don't know. They're like, he's out anyway. I don't know. No, that's, that's, that's terrible theology. Don't, don't listen to that. Okay. All right. Can you think of any other time in Scripture where there were some people in a boat and there was a storm and somebody was sleeping and they had to go wake him up? What was another time? Jonah. Remember that story? 
Jonah was down in the boat and he was sleeping. And they went and woke him up. They're like, dude, what are you doing? You got to pray. Here, here's the difference of those two stories. Jesus wakes up, and again, I, I know I'm giving away the end of the story. I'm that guy, right? Jesus wakes up and he calms the storm. But Jonah, he wakes up and he's like, yeah, this is my fault. Here's what you got to do. You got to throw me overboard if you want the storm to stop. Similar stories, but quite different, isn't it? And I love just a few chapters later in in Matthew chapter 12, verse 41, Jesus is speaking. He says, and indeed, a greater than Jonah is here. He was talking about himself. He was talking about how Jonah was on this boat. He got thrown over in three days. He was in the belly of a big fish. And Jesus is like, you know what? Yeah, kind of similar, but a greater than Jonah, a greater than that prophet is here. And that was him. So back to verse 25, the disciples went and woke him saying, Lord, save us, we're going to drown. He replied, you of little faith, why are you so afraid? Now, okay, so they're already nervous about waking up Jesus, right? And the first words out of his mouth were, you of little faith, why are you so afraid? You think at that point they probably would have gone, probably should have just drowned. (laughs) You know, I wouldn't have wanted that for that to be Jesus's first words to me. But here's our second point. Simple followers of Jesus understand fear is the opposite of faith. Fear is the opposite of faith. Now, I'm not saying that if you have faith, you won't be affected by storms because that's terrible theology, okay? Uh, like, like there are preachers out there, and I want to warn you, I want to I wanna challenge you to test that according to what Scripture says and prayerfully what you hear here. There are plenty of preachers out here, not going to name drop or anything, but you would know their names, that have a habit of preaching way more to the blessing side. Listen, I'm all about Jesus' blessing. And they're preaching oh, way more on, hey, if you get Jesus, Jesus is just going to fix all of your problems. Now, ultimately, eternally, does Jesus fix your problems? Absolutely. But Jesus doesn't just step into your life and go, oh, that problem, that problem, that problem. Yep, okay, you don't have those problems anymore. That's not how it works. Actually, I, I, it's probably not one of those things that you really want to say from the pulpit, but sometimes it's kind of the opposite, like, there are verses in Scripture that say you're going to have problems. John 16, In this world, you will have trouble. I'm like, thanks a lot, Jesus. Love your promises. Don't really care about that one, okay? That one's not my favorite. You're going to have trouble in this world. But again, we refer back to what we said earlier, that God uses those storms to bring him glory, honor, and praise. Remember another time when there was a storm and some disciples in a boat and Jesus, or, uh, Peter decided to get out and walk on water like Jesus was? That was pretty cool, right? I would have liked to have been there for that. I'd have liked to have done that. But when did he start to sink? What, what, what was the moment, what was the event that happened when he started to sink? What did he do? He took his eyes off of Jesus. When we have our eyes fixed on Jesus, guess what? When Peter was out walking on the water, did the storm go away? Nope, the waves were probably slapping against his legs, all of that. There was still a storm, but right here it was peaceful. See, that's what Jesus does. When we keep our eyes fixed on him and focused on him, there's gonna be storm raging around and and it still is gonna hurt. It still is gonna affect us. It still is gonna cost things. I get all of that, but there is just this peace that passes all understanding that scripture talks about, it is going to be there. Fear will overwhelm faith. When you allow fear to creep in, whatever faith you do have, that fear is going to overwhelm that faith. However, faith will overwhelm fear. See, that's really good news. We, we, we're, we're, we're human, okay? We're gonna fight against fear. 
But when we can elevate our faith above that fear, God says, hey, I've got you. Keep your eyes focused on me. I will not let you fall. I will not let you fail. So I I, I thought I would take a minute to kind of dig into this. Again, I I always want to give you guys handles just to hold on to, just to something to really to use or to apply. So I came up with some working definitions of faith and fear as it applies to this message. So here's, here's our definition of fear. Fear is allowing the potential outcome of circumstances. That's the fallout. That's, that's the bad things that could happen because of that. That's the what ifs. Remember we talked about when we, uh, a couple months ago when we talked about anxiety and fear, those what ifs that you start thinking at like three o'clock in the morning, it usually is. Well, what if the diagnosis is confirmed? What if that does happen and your mind starts to spin? That's what I'm talking about here. Fear is allowing the potential outcome of circumstances to overcome your trust in God's plan, power, and protection. That's what fear is, at least according to how we are talking about it today. Now, check this out. Here's the definition of faith, or at least my definition of it. Allowing the potential outcome of circumstances... Same start here, to be used by God and grow your trust in God's plan, power, and resurrection. You see the difference there? It's a huge difference. There's still going to be circumstances. There's still going to be an outcome. There's still going to be a storm around us. But the question is, and what faith is, is will you allow that to be used by God to bring him glory, honor, and praise. Does anybody other than John Weir, because we were talking about it this week, know what Newton's third law of motion is? Yeah, we're going to go science here for a second. You're, you're, you're going to recognize it's for every action. Oh, yeah, okay, I know that one. Okay. You were like, I thought that was the second law of motion. No, you didn't. Okay. For every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction. Now, that's a law. We don't get to argue with that. It's like, oh, sometimes, no, no, you don't get to cheat gravity, okay? That's a law, okay? That's every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction. You can't argue with the laws of science, except for today. Okay, so in a circumstance, I think it's a little bit different because of cor- uh, uh, according to Newton's third law, you would have an action, okay, a circumstance, That would be 50% of the equation because you can't get more than 100% unless you're Jesus, okay? So 50%, and then the other 50% would be your reaction, right? So you have an action and reaction. For every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction. So you'd have 50-50. In our circumstances, I think it's very different. I think the action is oftentimes, maybe not exactly this percent, oftentimes the action is about 10%. What really happens or what we're going through with that storm in life is probably usually about 10%. Our reaction is normally the other 90%, isn't it? Oh my goodness, what am I going to do? I'm not going to make it. I'm not going to get out of this. I don't know. And you see how we take something that's oftentimes, and maybe it's bigger than 10%, maybe it is 50%, maybe that one's 90%, but oftentimes, man, we just blow it up so much more. Our reaction is oftentimes so much worse than the action. And our fear, that's when our fear creeps in, and our fear often makes those things like 10x worse than what they really are. Faith over fear. Verse 26 again, he replied, you of little faith, why are you so afraid? Then he got up and rebuked the winds and the waves, and it was completely calm. And that word rebuke, it's actually the same word that he would use or that would be used for when Jesus would cast out demons, okay? So it was a very, very strong word. Verse 27, The men were amazed and asked, what kind of man is this? Even the winds and the waves obey him. Now, this makes me think, when they woke up Jesus, I wonder what they thought he was going to do. Like, I wonder, 
maybe they were like, Jesus, Jesus, okay, listen, we need somebody else to row. We can't do this by ourselves. We need you to grab a paddle and help us row in, right? That's, I mean, they weren't expecting him to just make the wind and the waves go away. Or Jesus, Jesus, listen, listen, um, we need you to get up and pray because that was the exact same thing that happened in Jonah and they would have known the story of Jonah. So Jesus, we need you to pray. Or, or hopefully it wasn't this because Jesus allowed him to live because if I, if I was Jesus, I wouldn't have allowed him to live if they did this to me. But it was like, Jesus, we're awake so you ought to be awake probably don't want to do that to Jesus, right? Okay, but look at this story. It says, it, 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 it points to a double miracle. Did you catch it? It says, what kind of man is this? Even the winds and the waves obey him. They saw two different things happening here. Um, you know that when you're in a storm, it's windy and there's waves and like crazy things are happening. And then the wind kind of lays down, the storm passes, and the waves kind of lay down a little bit, but it's still kind of choppy. There's some residual waves. Um, when Jake came down for his interview, um, we took him out on the boat. And I told you guys this before, it was, it was, it was, calm. It was this gorgeous day. And we like loaded the boat of yellow tail and we went out and we caught dolphin. I mean, it was a great day. And he's like, is it like this all the time? And I'm like, yeah. <laughs> okay. I'm sorry for lying to you. Okay. Um, and we were, we were way, way offshore and all of a sudden, like, and it was, it was nice and calm all of a sudden out of nowhere, it was still gorgeous, no wind or anything. We, we hit these rollers that were about 10 foot rollers out of nowhere. Now, now they weren't breaking, they were, they were, but you would just ride up and ride down, right? And I mean, they, they were big. And I was like, dude, this is awesome, you know, because I love it. I don't care. I'm crazy like that. And, and, but, you know, you look over at Jake and that's a lovely shade of green, Jake, you know? And uh, no, it wasn't that bad. But just there is this residual and there were just like, Jesus can control not only the wind, but he can control, like, like, what kind of a man is this? They obviously didn't get it yet. They obviously were like, this, okay, this guy might be the real thing. And remember, this is earlier on in his ministry. They're like, this, this might be the guy. This might be the Messiah, Jesus. Even the winds and the waves obey him. Now, if it were, we normally read the NIV, and it says they were amazed. If you look at the King James or New King James or other versions, the word that's used there is marveled. They were marveled at this man. This brings us to our last point. Simple followers of Jesus, give him room to make you marvel. Do you do that? Do you give Jesus room in your life to make you marvel? So I have a few questions here that I want, I want to ask you. And I really want you to think about these questions according to yourself, like, really, is this me? So the first question, are you even in the boat with Jesus? Are, 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 you, are you just even in the boat? Like, okay, there were a lot of people that were following him. They were, you know, kind of, maybe they were looking for a free meal. Maybe they wanted to be healed. Maybe they just wanted to, to witness a miracle. I mean, that would be pretty cool, right? So Jesus would have people following him all the time for various different reasons. But there was a select handful of them that said, no, no, I'm going to follow you in a way that I'm going to get in the boat with you. So are you in the boat with Jesus? Are you following him that closely that it's like, Jesus, wherever you go, I, I'm going with you, dude. Because like, what else do I, I, I love Peter's answer when, when yeah, like, Jesus, you're all we've got. We've left everything. Like, I, I, I've got nothing else. I'm following you. So you, are you even in the boat with Jesus? Here's another question. Are you living a life that provides opportunity for him to show you his glory? That's the second question. Are you living a life in a way that it just, you're providing opportunity, you're creating space for God to do amazing things? Are you? And here's the big question, you see it on the screen. Are you stepping out in faith 
in ways that God must come through or bad things could happen. Just let that one sit there for a second. Are you stepping out in faith in ways that God must come through? Like, like you ever had that moment? Like, okay, God, I'm going to trust you. And if you don't come through on this, God, like, like I don't know, like, I don't know what's going to happen. But I feel like you're calling me to this, God, so I'm just going to trust you with it. That's scary. Oh, it's so scary. But it's amazing. Are you giving God opportunities to work miraculously through you. One quick story and I'm done. Many years ago at at my former church, I was the youth pastor um, and I was just part-time. Now, I want to be very clear, and I've said this before, I was working full-time because there is no such thing as part-time student ministry especially. I was getting paid part-time, okay, but the work was full-time. And I worked another full-time job, and I did extra side jobs, and Nikki worked full-time. And I, I, I just, I'll make a point here, things were tight, okay? Things were really, really tight with both of us working full-time, and we were just a young couple trying to get things figured out. And I felt God growing me in my ministry, I felt God doing something in me that was different. And I'm like, God, what is, what is going on? Are you calling me to something greater? Are you calling me to more? And he starts to stir in me. And I finally hear him say, no, it wasn't an audible voice. It wasn't just an all-in-once aha moment. But I just, over different circumstances, I, I, I eventually heard God say, Nikki doesn't need to work full-time anymore. And I'm like, Lord... I'm not great at math, okay? But that math doesn't work. If Nikki doesn't work full time, we're not going to be able to make it. And he's like, just trust me. And so I went to her and we we had a talk about it. We prayed on it for a while to make sure we were really hearing from God. And we decided that Nikki wasn't going to work full time anymore because I felt God saying, hey, you need a little bit more margin in your life, and Nikki can help you with that. And so, you know, she just works part-time and does odds and ends, and I'll make it work. God's like, you know, by the way, I invented math, okay? I can work this out. And I'm like, okay, Lord. And we did. And it was amazing. that There was no, oh, one person stepped up and wrote a check. and No, there wasn't. But it just, God just, somehow we paid the bills. And here's the even crazier part of the story. In 2004, or actually in 2002, God started speaking to us about building a house. And I'm like, okay, God, math? He's like, I got you, okay? And we bought two lots in Key Largo in 2002 on a regular job and a part-time youth pastor salary and her working part-time. And in 2004 to 2006, we built a big, beautiful home in Key Largo. On, in, on that same step of faith that, God, we're not going to make it if Nikki doesn't work full-time, much less build a house. And I'm not saying that, to, I'm not bragging. I'm saying that because I promised God a long time ago that I would use that house because it was such a miraculous blessing from him that I would use it in whatever way I could to bring him glory. So if I can stand on this stage and say, it wasn't me. It was God that, that, that in the craziest time of, I didn't think we were going to be able to pay the bills to, you're also going to build a house in the Florida Keys on the salary? What? Yeah. Are you creating opportunities in your life for God to step in and do something miraculous? Because guess what? I, I, I'm going to let you in on a little hint, and then we're done. He wants to. He wants to do miracles in you and through you. God loves showing off. I don't know if you know that about God. He loves to show off. Now, not in a prideful, oh, check me out, I'm so cool kind of way. But God loves to bless his children and show off in the meantime doing it. So are you giving him opportunity to do that? 
So three characteristics of simple followers of Jesus. Number one, simple followers of Jesus are not exempt from life-threatening storms. Number two, simple followers of Jesus understand fear is the opposite of faith. And number three, simple followers of Jesus give him room to make you marvel. Let's pray. God, thank you. Thank you that you step up. God, and you call us to step out in faith. God, help us to do that. God, I know that there are people in this room right now going through a storm. And I know, God, we talk a lot about storms here. I kind of even wondered why we're going back here. But God, you've got something for somebody to hear this morning that is going through a storm, that is going through a trial in their life that they just don't know if they're going to make it. God, I pray that your word this morning speaks to hearts in a way that it makes them see maybe, just maybe, God, you're going to do something with this. Whatever circumstance you're in, whatever issue you're facing, whether it was self-induced or you had nothing to do with it, God can use it. So will you give it up to him? And say, God, you are fully in control of my life. God, you have all of me. God, we did a baby dedication earlier, but God, would we have a dedication of an entire church of people giving their lives back to you? Maybe they're just kind of running from you or have stepped away from you. God, maybe they never knew you. Right now in this moment, Lord, would your spirit work in this place in a way that it just brings people to you? God, your word says that you, you desire us, that you are standing at the door, you're knocking, you want to come in, you're waiting for us to let you in. What an awesome God. God, I know that, that that's, that's not well taught, but God, you are a God that pursues us. So God, just help us to open the door. Help us to realize, God, that keeping our eyes focused on you is the only way to live. We are not exempt from storms. But we know, again, we can have the peace that passes all understanding when our focus is fixed on you. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. If you're here this morning and you are in the middle of a storm, you are going through it. I don't know what your issue is or your problem is, but I would love to just be able to pray for you. I'm not going to call you out. I'm not going to make you stand or anything, but would you just slip your hand up and say, I'm in a storm right now. I need prayer. I've got things going on in my life. Thank you. Thank you. God, I don't know if I'm going to make it till tomorrow. God, I just pray for those this morning who are in the middle of that storm. God, would you bring the peace that only you can bring? God, would you, would you bring joy in the midst of that storm that only you can bring? Because you love us, God, and you want to bless us. Maybe you're here this morning and you're not even sure that you've gotten in the boat with Jesus yet. You know some stuff about Jesus. You, maybe you've been coming here for a while. You've, you know, relied on your good works. But maybe this morning you realize, man, I don't even know if I'm in the boat with Jesus. Right now in this moment, would you just say, God, I want you. Jesus, I, I, I want to make you my savior. I want this peace that Trevor is talking about. I want this joy even in the middle of a storm. You can have that this morning. So if that's you, if you want to jump in the boat with Jesus, I just want to give you an opportunity to do that. 
Just say this, say, Jesus, I need you. I want you. I trust you. I trust that you hung on a cross and died for me. And three days later, you rose again. Proving authority over death and sin. Jesus, be my savior. I give you my life. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. If that's you this morning, you decided to commit your life to Jesus today for the first time, I would love to know again. I'm not gonna call you out, but would you just slip your hand up? Say, today I got it. I stepped into the boat with Jesus. I made him my savior. Just put your hand up. Jesus, thank you that you are good. Thank you that you are a God worth following. God, we trust you. So God, help us to overcome our fear with faith. Help us to ride in the boat with you no matter what. And help us to keep our eyes fixed and focused on you. And God, we pray for this time of offering. Thank you, God, that we have such a generous church. God, help us to be generous to this community and this world. And help us to do things that are gonna matter in 10,000 years. God, we love you and we praise you and it is in your awesome name that we pray, the holy name of Jesus, amen.